perfect watercolour greens. Today I've got 10 really simple tips for you that are going to improve your use of green in your paintings. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find watercolour, drawing tutorials, even a little bit of mixed media, motivation and business too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So greens are an area that many of you struggle with and it's one thing that I notice about beginners work is sometimes they have a bit of trouble with greens. Perhaps the greens look too unnatural, perhaps they look too dull, too bright or maybe just not varied enough. We're going to address all of those things in this video. I'm going to give you 10 tips, really simple tips that are going to help you not only with ready-made greens but also with mixing your own greens. So let's get started and look at tip number one. So for my first tip, it's all about the order in which you mix the paint. So I'm going to tell you whether you need to start with the blue or with the yellow. This is going to vary depending on the type of green you're mixing, but it's going to save you an awful lot of paint. If you've ever been sort of mixing and mixing, you need to put more yellow in and you just keep putting more and more and more in and you think I'm going to use half a tube of paint before I even adjust this color correctly. Let me explain to you which of the two colors you need to start with. As I said, it varies depending on the sort of green you wish to achieve. So before we start let's um, talk about the materials I'm using. This is a sheet of SAA practice paper. It's similar to Bockingford. It's a UK brand. I'm only using practice paper today because we're just swatching. The brush I'm using is by Jackman's Art Materials. It says sable on it but um, most of you know that I'm vegan. I don't use sable brushes. It's only got the words gold sable on because um, it's an early manufacturer sample from when we were developing my brush set and the brands of paint. I'll be using lots of brands today and I'll tell you which ones they are as we go along. So I'm going to start here. I've got some of this Hansa yellow. It's very similar to lemon yellow. So this is one of the colours from my Jackman's Essentials set. So most people will need a, a light yellow like this. It's not really important for this first tip which yellow I'm using. I just want to show you the effect of mixing the blue and the yellow together. So obviously you know if you mix blue and yellow you get green. But let's think about whether we start with the blue or whether we start with the yellow. Now I would advise you to generally speaking start with the yellow and I'm going to show you why. But there are a couple of exceptions to that. So let me put some yellow paint in my palette here. And I'm going to clean my brush. Many of you asking me as well where I get these ceramic dishes. I'm afraid I just pick them up in places like um, kitchenware stores. They're, they're not actually paint palettes, but I, I really love them. I think this one's for dips or something like that. I've also got now, I've got a touch of this um, Thalo Blue here, which is also my essential set. I'm going to just take a tiny swipe of colour on it. I've got the tiniest amount of paint. So let's see what happens when I add it to the yellow. Straight away, it goes green. And if I get some more, I can make it greener. So there we have, we've got a really bright green, which is typical of um, using a bright yellow like this and a phthalo blue. So let's swatch that one. So we'll put some here. Now you'll notice that it took hardly any blue to turn that yellow to green. And here's the problem if you start with blue. Now, if you start with blue and you're looking for a light green like this, you're going to need to add so much yellow to it. You could literally end up having to add a whole tube of yellow if you had, you know, a serious puddle of blue to start with before you got a green this light and loads of water as well. So you're really going to be wasting paint if you start with the blue. Now, there are two exceptions to that. Also, generally speaking, I would start with the yellow when you mix your greens. But there are two exceptions. The first exception is when you want a very, very dark green. So in this case, what we'll do, we'll use the same colors, shall we? I'll get plenty of this blue and I'll place it in here. I'm going to get a lot and not much water because I need to have a very dark green. And now I'll clean my brush and I'll take a little bit of the yellow and it's starting to go. It's almost gone rather teal colored there. Do clean your brushes between dips. I'm just I'm doing things quickly for the sake of filming. And we're starting to get a dark green here. Let's go a little bit further. I'm not going to stick this lid back on my paint. Don't worry without cleaning. And there we have our dark green. So in that case, what I did was I started 
with the blue because I wanted a very dark green. Now there's a second exception to this start with yellow rule and that's if I'm looking for a turquoise colour or an aqua colour. Now what I'll do is I'll start with a different blue this time. I'm going to start with a much softer, lighter blue. So I've got some Talon's Rembrandt Cerulean here. It's um, actually my favourite brand of Cerulean. Cerulean is a colour that rewards getting a very good pricey paint rather than one of the cheaper ones. There are certain paints that are fine in the cheap uh, section but this is an expensive pigment. So we've got a little bit of yellow leaking into it there but I'm just going to add a bit more. So let's clean my brush and just get a little bit of yellow. Slightly too much there because it's uh, Cerulean is a very weak colour so let's put some more Cerulean in. So this is what I mean, you only need a tiny touch of yellow in this case. So let's go back here. There we are, we're starting to get that kind of aqua colour that I was looking for. There we are, we could put more yellow in, some more of this yellow green in here and go a little bit further with it. There we are, but cerulean is a very weak colour so it's unlikely to be overwhelmed by the yellow in any case. So there are your rules. Generally speaking, if you're looking for light, bright greens, start with yellow. If you want a very dark green, start with blue. And if you're looking for a turquoise green, you again want to start with blue and you want to pick one of the blues that is already on the way to being turquoise, such as cerulean, corallium, manganese blue, or even thalo, if you don't use it too strongly. At this point, if you're enjoying this video and getting some value from it, can I please ask you to do me a favor? Could you click the thumbs up, the little like button in the corner? YouTube rewards videos with audience interaction. So if you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. I can teach more people how to paint. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me on YouTube. Now, in many beginner sets, ultramarine is the only dark blue that's included. Now, ultramarine will always give you a dull green. Now, this is not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It depends on the type of green you're looking to achieve. Let me explain to you the effect that mixing with ultramarine will have on your greens. So I've got some ultramarine here and this is the Jackman's Art Materials Ultramarine, French Ultramarine Deep. French ultramarine tends to be a little bit more purple leaning than the standard ultramarine, but they're both very close. Again, this is a handwritten pot because it's a sample that I was sent. Now, let's look at ultramarine on its own. Often with beginner sets, this may be the only dark blue that you're given, and you may be tempted to mix almost all of your greens from it. There are some sets that start out with ultramarine and cerulean. So let's look at this as a color. It's a very, what they would call a warm blue in that it tends towards the red end of the spectrum rather than something like a turquoise blue that tends towards the yellow end of the spectrum. Now what this means is that this already is on its way to being purple. This already has a tiny hint of warmth, a tiny hint of red in it. Now if you look at green where you have yellow and blue mixed together if you're mixing your own, there are of course single pigment greens but don't worry about that too much if you're a beginner. So if we look at the color green it contains yellow and blue. This already has a bit of red in. We're introducing the third primary. Now, if you mix the three primary colors together, that's red, yellow, blue. And again, those are only the primaries for artists. Green is actually a primary color when it comes to science and light levels, but don't worry about that. So if you mix your yellow and your blue together and you get green, if you introduce your third primary, which is red, you are going to get a mixed color, a brown or a gray, depending on the balance of the colors. So because we already have red in this, it's going to dull down our green a little bit, which means that ultramarine will, generally speaking, mix a very dull green. So let's try and mix a green from this. And we'll use the, uh, the bright yellow again. We'll use the Hansi yellow. So let's put a little bit of this color in the middle here. I'm only putting a little down there, so that's why I'm starting with the blue. So let's put the yellow in here and get a little bit of that blue mixed in. So here we have a green, and this is using the brightest yellow, really. So imagine if you're using a dull yellow, like yellow ochre, you're going to get even more of a dull green. I think I've dripped some water in this one here, getting a nice, uh, nice back run happening there. Now, let's be clear, there's nothing wrong with a dull green. There are many dull greens in nature. It's very, very useful for landscape painting, and it's better, I think, to have a dull green than one that's too bright. However, it's really important to notice that it's a dull green and notice that it's not appropriate for everything. And if you want a bright green, you may have to 
introduce a different type of blue. So I just want you to understand that ultramarine will always give you a dull green. And I want you to understand why that is, because it's got a touch of red in it. And I just want you to know that that will help you to choose your blues and yellows when mixing in future. If you are aware of this tendency to go dull, you'll be able to make an informed choice when choosing ultramarine for mixing greens. So we're going to talk a little bit more now about that opposite colour, about red, and the effect that getting red accidentally in your greens or purple will have on your mixes. It's so important to keep your palette clean and understand what happens if you accidentally mix red and green together. So let's look now at palette hygiene. This palette is fairly clean because I tend to clean things up in between projects. It was pretty mucky the other day, but I gave it a rinse under the tap and a bit of a scrub and it's nice and clean now. Some people I see working with very, very dull palettes. Now, if we look at red and if we look at the colors that have red in, and I'm thinking specifically of orange and purple, if you get those colors near your green, you are going to dull it down. So if you're mixing, 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 and you've got, um, you know, you've got quite a nice bright green. Let's make this one a little brighter. Let's get a bit more yellow in it. Make this uh, nice bright green here. I'm gonna put it on the paper and I'm gonna show you what happens if we introduce red to it. Now, it doesn't have to be a lot of red either. It can just be a little bit of smudgy red that you had on your palette. Of course, the same goes for anything that you've got laying around your palette, like, you know, browns and greys as well but particularly colors that have red in. So let's put some red in this green. And can you see what's happening? It will either push it to brown or it will push it to gray. Most likely it will be brown because you'll find that the overwhelming balance is towards the red end of the spectrum rather than the blue end of the spectrum. And can you see how that's dulled that down? So if you are, for instance, painting some flowers and you've been painting red flowers and your water is very red and your paintbrush has got a bit of red on it, you don't want to go straight into painting your green leaves from there. Make sure that you clean your palette and more importantly, change your water. You don't want to be using red, purple or orange water or any kind of brown or gray when you are painting greens. Keep your reds away from your greens. They will always dull them down. So we've talked about the relationship of red and green. So let's look at now introducing that third primary on purpose when you need to dull a green, but we're not going to use red, we're going to use pink and I'll explain why. So moving on from our last point about keeping reds away from greens, what about using a red to purposefully dull a green? Yes, you can do that. I would suggest, however, that you use a pink. Now the pink is the cooler end of the red spectrum rather than the warm orangey end. What this is going to do is that the pink is going to make your green head more towards gray than brown. So you don't necessarily want brown sludgy looking greens, but maybe you want to just neutralize and cool your green down a bit, then what you need is pink. Now I've got this color here. This is a White Knights color by St. Petersburg. And this one is labeled emerald, but I pretty much guarantee that it's phthalo green. Emerald is not a particular color. It's just something that they've labeled it. So. Let's put our incredibly bright, unnatural phthalo green here, or emerald as St. Petersburg have labeled it. And I wanna cool this down a bit. So what I'm going to do now is get a pink. So the pink I've got here is permanent rose. I'm gonna take a little bit of this and pop it in my green. It's a very strong color, so we don't need much. And let's look at the effect that this has on our green. Can you see it's just starting to neutralize it a little bit and make it just a little bit more of a bearable color, shall we say. Now, you don't have to have permanent rose. Other colors that will do the trick are opera rose, magenta will work, as will any of your quinacridone pinks or quinacridone rose. You can add a push, use alizarin. Alizarin can be a bit of a dirty color. So if you don't have a pink in your palette, I would recommend getting a permanent rose. The one I've used here is by Jackman's Art Materials and it's part of my essentials set. I'll leave the details for that in the video description, but any permanent rose that you have in your palette or any other bright pink will do a fantastic job of neutralizing your greens without making them too brown and too dull. So we're going to talk now about harsh and unnatural tube greens. We're going to talk particularly about phthalo green. We're also going to talk about why it's sometimes mislabeled as viridian, how you can tell the difference and what it means to your color mixing. 
So let's look now at the problem of greens that are too bright. I made a video when I first started on YouTube talking about colors you should avoid as a beginner and one of them I called Viridian. However, I wasn't talking about pure Viridian pigment. I was talking about paint colors in cheap sets that are often labeled Viridian. So this one is labeled Emerald and that's another thing they'll sometimes call it. So this is Phthalo green i know that because i've just looked at the back and it's pg7 that's pigment 7 it is thalo green if you have a beginner set that goes beyond the uh, the primary colors and goes into greens you're likely to be given this one it's a fantastic color for mixing but alone it is terrible it looks awful it's not very much like any color you would find in landscape you'd be very hard pushed unless you were perhaps in the rainforest in brazil or something like that to find a green of this color in nature. As I said, it's very useful for mixing. What you can do to tone this down is you can either do the pink trick. Another thing you can do is to use a very warm yellow. So for a really dull green, you could use something like yellow ochre, but I've got a little bit here of diarylide yellow. Another warm yellow would be something like Indian yellow, cadmium yellow deep. If you put a warm yellow in, you've still got a bright color, but you're just making it look a little bit more realistic. So this is a way that you can adjust your green. And I've done a whole video all about uh, adjusting greens. I'll try to link to that one in the video description as well. So it's important to recognize that phthalo green is a very bright shade. It may sometimes be labeled Viridian wrongly. It may also sometimes be labeled Emerald. Now, if I swatch it again, Let's put it here like this so you can see what it looks like. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to swatch some true Viridian. Now, Viridian is quite an expensive pigment, which is why it's often swapped out for Thalo, which is cheaper. And you'll find Thalo in many, many ready-made colors. Things like sap green often have some Thalo in. As I said, it's a fine color for mixing. It's the basis of many ready-made tube greens. But if we look at some true Viridian, and this one here is the Talons Rembrandt, so if we look at the true Viridian, I've got a little bit of binder in that because I'm just taking it from the top of the tube there, but you'll see that it's a much uh, more subtle color and a much less in your face color. Now, if you ever see a paint that is labeled Viridian hue, hue means color, it's likely to be phthalo green. Now, this idea of putting the word hue after a paint generally means that it is mimicking something. So if you think of it in terms of chocolate, Think of the difference between chocolate icing and chocolate flavored icing. That's where your word hue is. It's something that looks like the color, but isn't the color. Now there's not necessarily anything wrong with paints that are labeled hue, because sometimes they're just replacing colors that are fugitive, that fade, or that have been found to be uh, dangerous or aren't very environmentally friendly or just aren't available anymore. So there's nothing wrong inherently with seeing the word hue on a tube of paint. But if you see something saying Viridian hue, it's likely to be a cheaper phthalo green masquerading as Viridian. So just be aware of what to expect when you find this very bright Viridian color. Be aware that you'll need to adjust it if you use it at all. Be careful not to put it into everything if you're a beginner painting landscapes. And be aware that it may sometimes be labeled as emerald, Viridian hue, or Viridian inaccurately. So let's talk now about mixing really, really dark greens. I know some of you have struggled with this. You need to use a staining blue. Without a staining blue in your palette, you are never going to mix very dark greens. So let me explain which blues are staining and the effect that they will have on your green color mixing. So let's look at what to do if you need to mix a very dark green from yellow and blue. Now, if you only have something like cerulean in your palette, or perhaps you have cerulean and ultramarine, maybe some cobalt, you're going to struggle to get a really, really strong dark blue. You can mix a fairly dark blue from cobalt and from ultramarine, but if you want that really, really strong dark green, you're going to need a staining color. So which ones do I recommend? The one I would start with actually is Prussian blue. Now you can use phthalo blue, 
but as we've discussed the thalos are incredibly bright so if you do use thalo blue you're going to expect that you're going to get some really really bright greens as well as them being dark and strong so prussian is a good one to have in your palette this is prussian blue here and you'll be able to mix from this you'll be able to get a very dark natural green having said don't start with the blue i'm going to put a little bit of yellow in the side of it there we are so you can see you can get a very strong dark green with this another color which you could consider using a bit duller is indigo and you can even use Payne's Grey. I'll talk about that later in the video. But to start with, if you want a very dark green in your palette, I would recommend a Prussian Blue. This one here is by Talon's Rembrandt, but I have other brands in my possession as well. They're pretty much all good. So let's talk now about expanding your green color mixing to get some really muted greens. And for this, we're going to go outside of blue or yellow. Now you may think that only blue and yellow can be used to mix green. It's not true. Let me tell you about the other colors which will mix green. Now, have you ever been painting a sunset and accidentally ended up with some green in the sky and thought to yourself, how on earth did this happen? I didn't even use yellow and blue. Well, if yellow and blue made green, then you will get some hint of green if you mix any color that has yellow in it with any color that has blue in it. So let's look at colors that have yellow in. So we could look at oranges. We could also look at some of the warmer earth colors, things like raw sienna, yellow ochre. All of these have fairly strong amounts of yellow in. Now let's look at other colors than blue that have blue in. Now we could look at purple, but that's got so much red in, you'd be unlikely to end up with a blue. But two colors that do have a lot of blue in, one is black. Uh, technically black wouldn't be considered to be a color before you say anything about that in the comments. But pigments are different to light reflection, so let's include black as a color. Now, black is mostly blue pigment because if you think of red and yellow, the other primaries, they're not really dark enough to make black. So black has a lot of blue pigment in. Likewise, we talked at the beginning of the video of mixing all three primary colors together. Now, if you do that with majority blue pigment, you'll end up with gray. So gray also has a majority of blue pigment in it. So therefore you can mix gray with majority blue pigment with orange, which has majority yellow pigment and you can end up with green. So it's important to be aware of this, not only when you're trying not to mess up your sunset skies, but also if you want to get some much more muted, more interesting greens and you don't have a large range of tube greens. So I've got a little bit of permanent orange here. This is a Talons color. So let's pop some of that on the paper. Again, I'm getting rather a lot of binder here because I'm being too lazy to, uh, to squeeze it out properly. Let's do that. There we are. So here is your Talons Rembrandt Orange. Let's get a bit more of that pigment on the paper. And let's mix that with a little bit of Jackman's Payne's Grey. Payne's Grey is a very blue leaning grey. So this will often give you some greens. And there we are. We're getting a very greenish grey appearing there. Put a bit more in. And we start to get those murky kind of khaki colors showing up. Let's start with the Payne's Gray this time and add a brighter yellow. So I'm starting here with my Payne's Gray. So I'm going to put some Hansa yellow in. Again, this is similar to a lemon yellow. And look at that. We've got a lovely sort of dull khaki green there. Now Payne's Gray is another staining color. So again, you can get some really dull greens with it but you can also get some really dark greens with it so be aware that not only will blue and yellow make green but any color with a lot of yellow in and any color with a lot of blue in may end up making a green on your paper so one of the main mistakes that beginners make when doing something like a landscape or a garden painting is that all the greens pretty much look very similar. It can be hard to get an interesting painting. Everything can start to look too dull or too bright. Let me explain how to avoid this and get a much wider range of greens in your palette and on your painting and the positive effect that this will have on your work. So for this next tip, I want you to uh, have a look at all the greens that we've got on this paper for one thing, apart from that one blue, we've mostly got greens here. And I want you to think about using a wide range of colors within a landscape. So often in beginner's landscapes, I see everything mixed from ultramarine, so everything is rather dull, or I see everything mixed from phthalo green, everything is far too bright and unnatural looking and you just don't have a full range of greens. Not only do I suggest that you fully explore the yellows and blues in your palette, but also you think about some other ready-made greens. You can get single pigment ready-made greens and you can also get mixed ready-made greens. So let's have a look at a few more greens. This one here 
is Fresh Green. This is from my floral set of paints. So we have a nice fresh green here. It's quite different to all the others, isn't it? Let's look at another one that I really love, and that's Daniel Smith Green Gold. This is quite a well-known color. It's absolutely beautiful. Let's swatch this one as well. Really, really interesting there. And let's choose a much duller green now. So this is one of my favorites as well. This is Chrome Oxide or Chromium Oxide Green. This one is by Jackman's. I also own the one by Talon's Rembrandt. Look at that, it's a gloriously natural, dull looking green. So you can see all of the range of greens that are available as ready mixed colors, but also you don't even have to worry about ready mixed greens. I spent many years before I ever went near a ready mixed tube of green, just mixing all of my greens from a selection of blues and a selection of yellows. So for my next tip, I'm going to encourage you to mix the greens on the paper rather than in your palette. What on earth do I mean? Let me show you. It's going to make your greens so much more vibrant and interesting. So what I've done here is I've got some Hansa yellow and I've mixed with some phthalo blue and I've made a green and I'm going to apply it to the paper. So I've applied my green to the paper there. That's all very well, it's a nice green, but imagine if I was painting a large foreground on a landscape. It's rather flat and it's rather uninteresting. So let's look at the way we apply it to make it more interesting. Now what about if rather than pre-mix this green, I just put the colors straight on the paper. So I'm gonna start with the yellow because that's the general rule is start with the yellow and let's apply it. We'll do a larger patch here like so. And what I'm going to do then is put some blue straight onto the paper. Now that seems a little bit scary. In fact, I've changed to, uh, I've changed to a different blue here. I've changed to ultramarine. But can you see there how you can get a much more interesting effect? We're still getting green, but it's a lot more textured and it's a lot more unusual. Let me do it again with the phthalo this time, which is what I meant to grab before. The fun of YouTube. Can't get the paint off the paper, can you? So here's my yellow again. Let's go in this time with the phthalo, like we did in this sample here, this first sample. And I'm just gonna start applying that to the paper, like so, and we can get a much more textured, much more interesting effect. Another thing we can do is we can start applying the paint and then gradually add other colors. So let's do more than two colors this time. So I'm gonna go in here like this. I've got some yellow ochre here, which is a much duller color. Let's get a bit of phthalo in that. Back to the yellow, some more of the phthalo, and some more Hansa. So look at this patch of green if you were painting a foreground compared to the first patch of green here. Look how much more interesting it is. You can mix as much or as little as you want so that you retain some of those individual pigments on the paper. You can always add yellow and blue straight to the paper. You will always get green. You don't have to panic when you put it on its bright yellow or bright blue. You will always get green. Basic science predicts that this must happen. And if there's ever an area that you want to darken when you're painting your greens, you can always put your blue straight in and darken it like this. So can you see how you get a much, much more interesting application by working wet into wet like this? Wet into wet is one of the techniques that I teach on my latest watercolor painting course, which is all about getting texture as you apply the paint. I'll put a link to that course in the video description if you're interested in that. But meantime, I do suggest that when you are mixing your greens, particularly when you're working in landscapes, that you mix directly on the paper. So whether you're using ready-made greens or mixing your own, Color charts are really important. You need that wide range of greens and it's quite hard to hold them all in your head. I'm gonna show you now three types of color charts that you can make for your greens. So let's talk about color charts now. It's really important to make color charts, especially when you're a beginner. It'll stop you getting stuck in a rut with your greens and ending up, as we said, with just one type of green throughout your whole picture. Now, the first thing you can do is a mixed color chart for your yellows and greens. This is a very old color chart. I mean, this is about 20 years old, but what I've got here is I've got my yellows along the top, and then I've got my blues down the side, and wherever they meet, a bit like a map reference, you go along, so cobalt blue, cadmium yellow deep, 
we get this sort of green. Now, of course, there's a huge variation, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, between how much yellow and how much blue and how much water you put in. So this here just gives you an indication, and you'll see that I'm getting the brightest, clearest yellows around here where I've got my lemons. If I go up here to where I've got my yellow ochres, I get really, really dull greens, and the same along the bottom here with my Payne's Gray, I get dull greens with the cerulean blues, I get delicate granular greens. So by mixing your blues and yellows like this, you will be able to make a little chart of all of the greens that you can mix from the colors you already own. If you include things like orange and gray that we already talked about, even black, you'll get a massive range of greens just from a few basic colors in your box. The second type of color chart that it's uh, useful to make is from your ready-made or tube greens. So this one here is fresh green. This is a mixed pigment color. As I said, this is a color that I designed. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make a different type of color chart this time. I'm going to make a chart that shows what this color looks like when it's really dark and also when it's diluted down. Of course, you could mix it with other colors. You could mix it with other yellows and other blues. You know, color mixing charts could just go on forever, but this is really useful. And I actually advise that this is the first sort of color chart that you make for all of your colors, including your reds, your purples, anything else, is a chart that just shows you what each of your colors look like when they are watered down. So what you're gonna do is start with the color pretty much as dark as it goes, and then you're going to come across and just start adding more and more water. And this is going to give you a great indication of what this color looks like when it's watered down and what it looks like when it's really dark. And especially with things like the reds where they water down into pinks, you're going to find a huge amount of variation from how the color looks when it's very dark to how it looks when it's very pale. So this is a color chart that's great to make for your ready mixed greens. It will really show you exactly how they're going to look on your picture. The third type of color chart, which is optional, but that you can make, is a color chart that just has all the variations of one particular mix. So in other words, one of your yellows with one of your blues, I want to see how many different types of green you can make from just those two colors, bearing in mind that you can use more of the blue, less of the blue, more of the yellow, less of the yellow, you can use more or less water. So let's pick something unusual here. I'm going to take my phthalo blue and my yellow ochre and see what I can make from it. So here I've got this dull green, which I would expect because I'm using yellow ochre, which is pretty much an earth color. It's also a yellow. So I've got a green like that. What about if I add more water to that green? What about if I go further into the blue, adding just enough yellow to keep it green? So we've got a very blue biased green here, almost a teal, isn't it? What about if I water that right down? That's a pretty color, look at that. What about if I go Continue with the water down, but I go more into the yellow. And then I can continue so far into the yellow, looking much more of a yellow color now. I can really carry on with this idea as long as I want. So I'm going more into the blue here. Let's go more into the yellow, but mix a much stronger, more opaque color. What about if we take that color and water it right down? So you'll see where I'm going with this. So within one single mix, so I've got phthalo blue and yellow ochre, I have made all of these greens. I could probably take it up to as many as 10 different greens by varying the amounts of water, varying the amounts of yellow and varying the amounts of blue. So I want you to think about the blues and yellows in your palette and consider what a huge range of greens you have already at your disposal. So do let me know in the comments which of these tips you found the most helpful. Before you leave this video, do pop into the video description and grab one of the free downloadable PDFs I have for you. You can get those for no money whatsoever. And if you do need more help than I can give you here in these short YouTube videos, you could consider joining my Patreon, where you can follow along with every single part of my own painting step by step, or perhaps you would prefer to take a short online course with me. I have some fantastic targeted courses, my most popular one is the basic watercolor techniques for beginners, but I have others too, including courses on watercolor pencils and mixed media. You'll find the link to Patreon and to my courses in the description of this video. If you're all excited about the prospect of mixing lots of lovely greens, but you need a little bit more help with your landscape drawing, I have a great video that's going to help you with that. You can watch that video right now.